Hello, welcome everyone. This is our very first virtual learning experience and a virtual lecture in collaboration with Chapman University and Six Lens. Um, this one's particularly with a very talented author and a professional, Karen Dosan. She's the author and editor of the book, Untold Stories, The South Asian Experience in British Columbia. Uh, we have been talking to her for a very long time regarding how she came up with the book. I'll let Ezra introduce Karen Dosanj and Ezra will tell us a little more about the, uh, this particular lecture, virtual lecture thing, uh, a little bit about the Chapman University and Six Lens. Hi, my name is Ezra Nawar. I'm the development librarian as well as the chair of the Arts Exhibits and Events Committee at the Leatherview Libraries at Chapman University. And it is my honor and pleasure to talk to speak to you today and introduce our speaker for one of our sequence virtual lectures. Uh, before I get started and introduce our speaker, I wanna talk to you a little bit about the sequence Chapman collaboration that has started a few years ago. But we wanna first thank the founder of Sequins Foundation and Film Festival, Mr. Vicky Singh. Well, at the time when we started this collaboration was a university uh, with a parent of a university um, student, Anupreet Singh who since then graduated and went on to, to uh, do great things. And we're very, very proud of her. The collaboration consists of many things. One of them is the film festival that is done each November at, uh, in collaboration with our Dutch Film um, and Media Arts College. We also at the Leatherby Library since then have been collaborating with Mr. Vicky Singh and the Sequence Foundation on a variety of exhibits and lectures that have been part of our archives since then. And you can actually go back and look at these archives in our digital commons and you will see the link on the screen. These lectures were part of our history, were part of our collaboration. We spoke about the Sikhs in the Great War, the 1984 Not Forgotten, the fashion of the Sikhs, the politics, the David Thin story, and many, many more. And we plan to continue to tell stories of Sikhs in America and around the world. One of the greatest initiatives that we've done with the Sequence Foundation was the, was the dedication of the Sikhs and Sikhism in America story room, which is located in our second floor of the Leatherby Libraries. Of course, in regular times, you would be able to go and uh, visit this room, which highlights Sikhs in America. Also, it erases the misconceptions and gives information about the Sikh religion and it talks about a variety uh, of, of things about the culture and the religion itself. It also highlights prominent Sikhs in America um, that have uh, a lot of, have had a lot of uh, leadership positions in the United States, as well as in the world. We also highlighted the contributions of Sikhs in the uh, US Army, as well as the struggle to wear the turban in the US Army as well uh, um, while serving. So I encourage all of you to contact me when we go back physically on campus right now. Everybody is working remotely. We're still definitely providing all the services and access to our materials and resources, including the Seek archives uh, in a digital fashion. But soon enough, when, uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, ends, hopefully soon, we will be able to showcase this wonderful room that we're very honored to have. It's been a model for a lot of universities to actually follow. Now, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, our speaker today, Karen Dosange, who will sp be speaking to us about the untold stories of uh, Asians in Canada. Karen comes to us with a great background. Through her 25 year career, Karen has built a reputation as a trusted advisor and expert in marketing, communication, and pub public relations. She works at a, a Fortune 500 company uh, and has led and provided business and technology solutions for them. On a personal note, in addition to her work as a community in pu public relations and communications, she's dedicated to helping others rise. It is part of her DNA and she brings a deep commitment to giving back to her local community. Karen was named a Shakti Award winner for professional achievement in 2019. She's actively advocating for women issues in business and technology all over the world. 
She's done this project on a volunteer basis. She donated her time and talents to serve as the author and editor-in-chief of this book, Untold Stories, The South Asian Pioneer Experience in British Columbia, which is a book that she will be talking about today. As a librarian, I'm very excited about this book, uh, and I can't wait to get a chance to read it. And I also know that Sequence Foundation will make it available for its patrons. So please contact Mr. Bicky or anyone who uh, is part of the Sequence Foundation if you're interested in getting the book. This uh, is, she is a visionary for this AAJ Legacy Initiative. And for her, uh, preser preserving pioneer voices for future generations is truly a passion project that she began in 2006. When she helped her family document their forefather, Babash Jayan Singh, 100 year celebration in Canada. She partnered with many people to make this story happen. I know she's done a lot of research and I know how much work she's put into um, this book and definitely the passion. Please enjoy the lecture and help me welcome Karen. And thank you for having me today. Thank you so much, Ezra. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for that great introduction. I did want to start off by welcoming everyone who's joined today's uh, virtual lecture and the, the official US book launch for Untold Stories, the South Asian Pioneer Experience in BC. And I did want to start off by thanking Sikh Lens and Chapman University for inviting me to, to be a part of this and to speak to you today. It's quite an honor. Um, I know that the book is making its way out to um, people in the US and particularly particularly in California, thanks to the work of Vicki Singh and Min Mindy Hutchinson. Um, and her book is also now international, uh, having uh, reached homes in the UK, in Australia, and in India. So it's, it's really humbling and it's quite a, an honor uh, to, to see the response that we're getting. Um, so really today, I'm hoping just to shed some light on what I learned through the process of writing this book and also um, helped educate the audience about some key milestones that affected South Asians in Canada. Um, I'm going to touch on everything from immigration bans to the other discriminatory actions um, that took place that I think are really relevant today, especially when we think about what's going on um, in the US and globally around Black Lives Matter and how we're really shining the light on the histories of marginalized peoples. And the South Asian community is, is, is among them and has also experienced, um, you know, these types of uh, things. So, you know, the book is very honest in its depiction of that and, and I'm quite proud of it. Um, it was difficult to write, it was painful to write as I uncovered things that I had never heard before myself. Um, and it helped me understand what, you know, potentially you know, my parents and, you know, other, you know, uh, ancestors may have gone through, um, you know, in their, their journey to Canada or the U.S. Um, so the end goal of today is really to engage and inspire the next generation of South Asian storytellers and content creators, culturally con cultural content creators um, all around the world, um, you know, to pick up the pen where I left off and, you know, we need more people like myself to dedicate their time to, to this type of work. There are so many stories left to be untold. Um, so really it's about sitting down with elders in your family and asking the right questions and listening and you know, mining for gold. Uh, every elder that we meet is a, is, a, is a walking library. And I think sometimes we, or we forget that. So that's really the essence of my talk here today. Tell us, Kiran, about your um, growing up in British Columbia, your journey as a child till the present moment, your relationship with your parents, um, how you develop, what has been happening. Uh, growing up in Richmond, British Columbia, I'm the youngest of uh, five children. Um, and I think, you know, being you know, in that birth order, I think it creates uh, quite an inquisitive mind. So I was always questioning everything, you know, and, and I think uh, as I was being raised, you know, your parents are, you know, working class people, they didn't always have time to provide you with the answers. They were always busy, you know, working multiple jobs, 
you know, blue collar jobs and coming home, you know, feeding the, the kids and going off to another job. So you know, it wasn't a lot of time to sit down and explain, you know, why, you know, did Jack dad choose Canada as a place for us to, to live and for our family to, to thrive. And, you know, they didn't also talk much about the familial separation that they had when dad did move to Canada in the 1950s and had to leave behind mom and three of my siblings. Um, you know, and these are sort of formative years of a family. And, you know, understanding some of these sacrifices and what that was like for my own dad, who came out to work in the mill community, you know, on his own, you know, with a group of family, um, you know, sending funds back home to support the, you know, the extended family. A lot of sacrifices were made. And I, I really wanted to understand because, you know, it was through his sacrifices and my mom's sacrifices, you know, being a single mother for, you know, many years, you know, we as Canadian born children, we benefited from that, right? And we had more opportunities given to us. And then now raising children myself, I'm raising two sons, and knowing that their opportunities are, you know, exponentially more than what my father had or what, you know, his forefathers had. Um, and the same thing, you know, I would say, you know, on my husband's side, um, we all also have a long legacy uh, in terms of pioneer lineage going back to the early 1900s. So these were just really important lessons I wanted to capture uh, for my own children. But it became bigger than that. It came, became more about, you know, how do we now share these stories for other kids who need to hear these stories as well? You know, maybe, you know, children that are from immigrant communities today that, you know, really would benefit from hearing the stories of resiliency and the, the tenacity to overcome hard times. Um, that really is, you know, a big part of, um, you know, what has inspired my, my, my passion project here with Untold Stories. Um, you had asked about my, my professional life, uh, my day job. I'm actually the vice president of marketing for a large uh, a global IT provider. And I've been in the, the tech marketing, tech communications field for you know, close to 25 years now. So, um, you know, and as well being a you know, visible minority woman, you know, I've had to work really hard to um, earn my seat at the table. So every year I take on passion projects, whether that's helping other women, other minority women break into technology and business. It's something I've been doing. Uh, but this year was just a special year where, you know, it was really all about, you know, preserving pioneer legacies and sharing some skills that I have as a writer and a communication expert um, to this project and uh, really bringing it to life. So kind of a way of balancing my, my personal uh, interest with my expertise to a point where somebody is actually interested in it. And, you know, that's been pretty amazing as what I've seen as the response uh, to the book so far. When I got the book, uh, the second day or third day, uh, so that's what I got. And I read it in the same, like, I would say I got it. 10 in the morning and by 10 p.m. I had already completed the book next day. So very exciting. All the all the archival photographs, like we have a few of them here. Uh, the marriage photographs. So the family is in here. Yes. Just tell me the, the journey of this book, the inspiration that you had for the book, for this project, how it came about, what was the process. And I often get asked for, you know, asked about where my passion for preserving South Asian history first started. And it did start uh, when my own family, my, the family that I was born into, started documenting the 100 year journey of our forefather, um, Baba Gyan Singh Dohal, who migrated to Canada in um, 1906. So in 2006, we had a 100 year celebration of his arrival. And I was asked to take the pen and uh, start to document his oral history. And with that, I interviewed our, my family elders and had conversations with them. And I was able to sort of piece together his experience from, from arrival to uh, his contribution uh, to why he did what he did and how much he impacted the family today. So today there's over 600 descendants of the Johal family tree thriving because Gyan Singh 
took the time to sponsor and help help you know specific members of each family each branch migrate and you know here we are today so i think it's not something that's lost on us we are now a family that is you know six generations in canada and uh you know gyan saying personally sponsored my own father who arrived in 1959 at the age of 24 and he had never forgotten the monumental impact that Yeon Singh had had. He didn't have a family of his own. He treated his, his nephews, nieces, uh, like his own children and made it his mission that, you know, his life's mission was to, you know, help the Johal family establish, establish its roots in Canada. So he made a lot of sacrifices and he, you know, he was also an entrepreneur. He had footprints in Calgary, Alberta, which I've learned by, uh, through records. Uh, through, through the Alberta Sikh Heritage Foundation uh, that he had footprints in Alberta in, in the early 1920s or the late 1920s. And he was also a activist and, you know, he's pictured here on the slide with uh, other known activists such as Dr. Bandia, whose story is also said in our book. So he was really aligning himself with influencers and he really wanted to make change. He wanted to see changes around the immigration laws he wanted to ensure that the children that were the pioneer children in Canada were learning and reading and writing Punjabi. And he opened one of the first Punjabi schools, makeshift Punjabi schools to, to, help, to help teach them. You know, so he's really all about preserving history and somehow, um, you know, that has rubbed off on me. You know, all these years later, you know, you, you know Gyan Singh would to think that we're sitting here today talking about him and honoring his journey. I'm sure he'd be very proud. Um, I think it's important that I connect to the Narayan Saints. Okay. Because that, that is when that story kind of became, it was on the front page of the Vancouver Sun. Yes. So that was kind of a pivotal moment for me to say, you know what, this is not just for my family, that this is something that has broad appeal. So in 2019, my passion really continued with the documentation of um, my husband's grandparents story the story of narayan singh who migrated in 1907 and mahakur de who migrated in 1929 so through interviews with my own father-in-law who is now 90 years old you know born and raised in canada in the 1930s um, he was a treasure trove of information about their journey and the journey of other pioneers as well so i sat down with him and my mother-in-law gurdiv kaur de Sange, and i was able to document their life experiences um, he told me that Narayan Singh was only 16 years old when he arrived and he came alone and he entered the port of Vancouver with like next to nothing in his pocket. And there was no welcome wagon here to greet him. In fact, you know, him and other South Asian migrants were very much unwelcomed here in BC. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, media reports that, uh, that you know, validate that. You know, he couldn't find a place to live. He couldn't find work at first. And, you know, dad even explained that, um, you know, Narayan Singh was forced to sleep in boxcars in those early days because he couldn't find a place to, to live. So, you know, these were really dark times for Narayan Singh. He was really tenacious and he wanted to find ways to, to succeed in this new world. And uh, he became, you know, one of the first five South Asian families in New Westminster, which when Mahako arrived and, um, you know, they started to build their family. Um, and by the end of his career, he was managing uh, a workforce of up to 700 men as a foreman in Fraser Mill. So, you know, it was a long way from sleeping in boxcars. So having written, you know, now Gyan Singh's story and Narayan Singh and Mahako's story, um, you know, I took the content to the Vancouver Sun and the Vancouver Sun was very interested, and in fact, put that story on the front page of their newspaper and did a complete full feature on the DeSange family journey, which is an incredibly proud moment for our family. But what that taught me is that, you know, these stories are not just for us, these, you know, for me and for my family. And if that was the case, it would be very self-serving. But, you know, these are, stories for the entire community and we needed to find other family stories as well as just my own and that is really you know what sparked 
the vision for untold stories, knowing that you know there's an appetite for this, and there's a desire from families to 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 do the same is what you know what I had done for the Joe Hall and the Desange families. Um, so really, this all of this work really validated that culturally diverse perspectives and storytelling matters, not just to the South Asian community, but to the broader community. You know, these are Canadian stories. They're not just South Asian stories. They're everyone's stories. And, and really that's, that was a pivotal turning point for me. So this next slide here, this photo on the left here is of a congregation at the First Sikh Temple in North America at West 2nd Avenue in Vancouver, circa 1935. And this picture created a lot of uh, curiosity for me because it includes my father-in-law, Sarjeet Singh, as a five-year-old boy at the bottom left-hand corner as marked. His siblings are in here. His mother, Mahakor, is in here. And his father, Narayan Singh, is also pictured here. But it also happens to feature the Johal patriarch, Gyan Singh. And I was really curious about, you know, whether or not they knew each other, what their common experiences were what their common challenges were, you know, had they known each other and how far back did our families go? And so this was a really pivotal moment for me. This picture never left my mind or my heart. And it inspired a lot of, you know, my future storytelling because I wanted to uncover that. And that's where the vision for the project was first formed. And I began my partnership with Suki Bengali of Lodge Media Group. Um, I also started working with educators. So on the right-hand side, you see me there uh, with my mother-in-law and father-in-law. We took uh, Narayan Singh's story to, to schools uh, with, you know, a very high immigrant population, high South Asian population. And we shared Narayan Singh and Mahakor's journey with these kids who were fascinated. And, you know, you would think that what would they see that's relevant? But they, they really... Um, were engaged and they were asking a lot of questions. So, you know, fantastic educators like Apri Corbains of L.A. Matheson and Nandish Saran from the Surrey School District have, you know, opened their doors to myself as a, as a speaker. And I've had a chance to go to schools and speak about Gyan Singh's journey as well. So to me, you know, this is really why I'm doing what I do. It's not, a, you know, just about you know, documenting this, the, these stories for my family or, or creating this book, it's getting it into the hands of the kids, getting it into the hands of the students, getting it into the hands of the teachers who can use this content as a resource. Because growing up, you know, there were no books about my history anywhere. There was no, no topics about uh, South Asians in our schools. Um, so this is a time to change that. You would think that all these years later that that's changed, but there's still a gap. And so, you know, this is really, um, you know, a project that's close to my heart, that these kids can learn a lot from the resiliency of the early pioneers and how they can apply that in their own life, or even with their parents who may be new immigrants today, you know, how can they also overcome challenges that they may be facing that are similar, um, you know, in, in modern times. So in May of 2020, we released Untold Stories, the South Asian Pioneer Experience in BC, right in the middle of a global pandemic. So we can talk a little bit more about that, uh, you know, and what that was like. But, you know, we really tried to capture this pivotal time in Canadian history by documenting the forgotten voices of the very first wave of South Asians who migrated to Canada from Punjab in the early 1900s. So these stories are relatively untold and they are a critical yet lost piece of the Canadian record. So the goal is to leave a lasting legacy for, you know, future generations and really help Canadians understand the rich contributions that South Asians have made to our country. So the first part of the book chronicles the early milestones for South Asians in Canada. And then it goes into 32 multi-generational pioneer family legacies. And it also profiles modern day trailblazers in the South Asian community. So, you know, we have those people only because of those that came before. You know, they, they, the people that we have today would not have had those opportunities to become the first, you know, attorney general or, you know, the first female broadcaster or, you know, the first, uh, you know, premier of British Columbia 
had it not been for the very first who arrived in the earliest days. So um, Until Stories, as, as I mentioned, was independently published by Suki Kayeli of Raj Media Group. So thank you to Suki for donating this project and funding it uh, at a time when it was difficult to get funding in the COVID era, where people are concerned about their businesses and their livelihood. Um, it, it was tough and you know, project almost didn't happen. Many times we had many, many barriers. So, you know, thank you, Suki, for uh, you know serving as the publisher. Uh, thank you, Christy Hill of Umbrella Design, who worked with me, you know, day in, day out on uh, creating a beautiful design that is, uh, you know, really engaging. And I, as mentioned, I think we have over a thousand photos that I was able to collect from families, and over seventy thousand words written. So it was a mammoth, mammoth undertaking. The book also features the original works of Jandeep Singh Reina, who is a, is a Canadian artist who is uh, inspired by South Asian history. So we used his original works throughout our book. And it's just a beautiful way to, to depict the South Asian uh, pioneer experience. So it's been wonderful. If anyone is interested in learning more about the project specifically, visit ajlegacy.com. Uh, to learn more about uh, about the project or to order the book. Talking about the the South Asian history at that point, uh, the culture aspect, like parents come there, they have a culture shock, they have to maintain their roots, their own culture, and when their children are born, they have to be acclimated to the new culture, which is a Canadian in that in in this case and they have to maintain their roots for of the, the Sikh upbringings and the Indian culture as well. And then there's sometimes kind of a gray area that gets created. So how, like, what, how, what's the South Asian history in Canada relevant in the present moment, like in both good and bad terms? Okay, um, so let me quickly touch on the author's process because there's a piece I missed there. Uh -huh. Because you had asked me about, um, you know, how did you collect these stories? Yes. So just in terms of, you know, my process as an author, um, I sat down with numerous pioneer families and elders. And in each case, uh, I had a content champion. So that content champion was somebody who uh, was younger, understood technology, was able to digitize photos for me, was able to fill out questionnaires and get, you know, essential facts to me so that I could you know, when I was sitting down with the elders in the interviews, you know, able to ask intelligent questions and then connect the dots, um, you know, and it was the elders who helped dust off, you know, old, you know, photo albums that hadn't been opened and photos that had never been shared um, and trusted, you know, me enough to do that. And I think that's a big part of it, you know, is you know, who are you? What are you doing with this information? You know, why, why, why would I want to engage with you? And so building that trust and building relationships with the Pioneer families is really part of what, you know, has made this book so successful because they really, you know, openly, you know, wanted to share as much about, you know, their, their ancestors as possible. And in some cases, the Pioneer elders that I was interviewing were either the child of the Pioneer or the grandchild. Uh, of the very first who arrived in the early 1900s. And they were a vital link and they are truly the last connection to those generations. So, you know, the timing of this was really important. I was interviewing people who are in their late 80s, in some cases in their 90s. So they're invaluable. They are living libraries. And, uh, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And, you know, when the book was finally produced, I was able to personally deliver copies of the book to the pioneer families and the elders from a safe distance. And just to see the joy in their eyes when they were to see tangibly their, their parents, their, you know, their grandparents' journey come to life. Um, it was really uh, very, very emotional for me. And I think that was when it validated that all this work that I was doing was, was truly worthwhile. Um, so, you know, it's, I had written over 70,000 words, I collected over 1,000 photographs, and I wrote 32 comprehensive pioneer family profiles, and this was well over a year-long process. 
So on top of a, you know, a busy career and raising children, this was a big part of my life. And, uh, you know, it's just great to see that it's come to fruition. And uh, it truly has been a labor of love and a passion project and a legacy initiative that I will leave behind. And, you know, it's, it's something I'm very proud of to have served, uh, to have volunteered my time um, on this project. It's my seva. We're thrilled that this project has garnered the support of the Honorable Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. Um, probably we were able to manage his endorsement when he was a little bit less busy than he is right now. Uh, but, uh, you know, he wholeheartedly uh, put his backing to this project right from the start. And that was really important because he opened a lot of doors for us uh, from that point forward. Uh, a little bit about the picture on the right. Uh, there's a quote there uh, from Justin Trudeau to passengers and to passengers' families of the Kama Gautamaru. He says, we apologize for our failure to recognize all that you had to offer. For those in the U.S. who may not be aware, the Japanese steamship, the Kama Gautamaru, sailed into the Kama's broad with 376 passengers. And upon arrival, they were categorically denied entry uh, as immigration officers and politicians deemed the ship had violated continuous journey regulations uh, since it had not sailed directly from India. So tragically, upon return to India, the ship was fired upon, 20 people lost, lost their lives, and over 200 were imprisoned. So this is a black mark in Canadian history, and it is something that you know, I, I think that has been documented in you know, later years. Uh, it's definitely not something I was taught about in schools, but I think that the Canadian government has really tried hard to, you know, reckon with what, has, what had happened um, and really, you know, help people understand that what took place was wrong. And that, um, you know, for, for folks in the US, you know, I do encourage you to learn about the plight of the Kamagawa Maru ship and its passengers. And, you know, there's many resources online. And of course, Untold Stories uh, covers this topic in great detail. So it's a really important story. The Honorable Harjit Singh Sajjan, who was, the, who was Canada's Minister of National Defense, and also the Honorable John Horgan, who was the Premier of British Columbia. So we had support, you know, at the very highest level, levels of our province and our country. And in the community, we held an event uh, in December of last year, just to launch and introduce the project to the community. And it was a sold out standing room event. And we didn't even have a book yet, you know, we had an idea. And so it was really exciting to have, you know, you know very influential people like media broadcasters, um, people who are politicians and leaders in the community, uh, teachers and you know, really you know, wonderful educators uh, and in just the general community coming out to say that you know, we, we endorse this project, we wanna be a part of it um, and we wanna share our stories. So you know, it was really, really wonderful. Um, to have that level of support. And since we launched uh, in the middle of COVID, we did have a big launch event planned in April, which of course we canceled because we were, you know, you know, not feeling good about having elders gather. This event would, would really have been a celebratory event for our elder pioneers. So we postponed that and uh, we will ha have that soon in the uh, Surrey Museum. Uh, we already have an exhibit uh, set up there, ready to go, so when the time is right and things are safe. But for, in order to understand where we are today, I believe that we must understand our past. And this, the first 40, 40 pages of Untold Stories focuses exactly on that. These are the key historic milestones for South Asians in BC. By setting the context early in the book, our readers are better able to understand the societal impacts that on each pioneer family that we have featured you know, later in the book. So Kesar Singh was a resolder major in the British India Army and is considered the very first Sikh settler in Canada who arrived in 1897. Many early Punjabi Sikh pioneers were veterans of colonial regiments that had served the crown since 1849 when Punjab became part of the British Empire. He was amongst the inaugural group of Sikh soldiers who arrived in Vancouver 
via the Empress of India. That Hong Kong regiment, which included Chinese and Japanese military, was en route to celebrate Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. So upon her arrival back in Punjab, the soldiers share tales about this extraordinarily scenic place called British Columbia, and they talked about the potential for work there, particularly in the formals, and, and the fact that yeah, the Punjabi people could build a better life there. And boy, did, did they follow uh, the word of those, those very first men uh, who, who arrived. So following the path of the Punjabi soldiers, a very small group of South Asians from the rural region of Punjab began their journey towards the promise of abundance in BC. Um, so they came here to fill jobs in the railway, the, uh, the farming, and the uh, forestry industry uh, in the local sawmills. So by the end of 1908, over 5,000 primarily Indian men arrived in BC, with about 3,000 of them actually continuing on to the U.S. And uh, we know California was, was uh, you know, another place where that they migrated to as a, as a point from BC. So I wanted to just clarify that the term South Asian, it does include people of all faiths. It's not just uh, the Sikh community. It also includes such as uh, Hindus, Christians, Muslims, and Buddhists. So when I talk about South Asians, um, you know, I do you know, focus in on a lot on Sikh stories, Sikh centric stories, but it also covers um, uh, these other, uh, other areas. Um, so in many cases, when the young men first arrived, they came alone after a very long and harrowing journey via steamship. And uh, there were no welcome wagons to greet them. You know, they were quite unwelcomed. They faced many racial barriers uh, in those early days. They were not openly assimilated into the broader Canadian community. Uh, they were, you know, here to fill difficult manual labor jobs. That's what they were here for. And they were, uh, you know, they were paid much less than their, uh, their counterparts, um, you know, other, other locals. And on average, they earned about a dollar to a dollar 25 a day. And, you know, they did, they were given those less desirable jobs. So I mentioned they weren't able to assimilate. They lived in bunk houses and they co-located with other um, South Asian uh, pioneers. And, you know, they would use that to their advantage. They would save their money. They would pool their money. They would cook together in communal cooking. And, you know, they lived in their employment site on the mill grounds. Um, but these Punjabi workers, they soon earned really formidable reputations as loyal, resilient employees with a very strong kinship to their community and a strong sense of family values. And that was rewarded by the mill owners. And you know, these, these men would you know, slowly move up the ranks. And I mentioned they pooled their money. They would eventually start to purchase their own mills and uh, became the mill owners. Um, you know, so it was very exciting times. By the, by the 1920s, as women started to arrive, there were a number of successful South Asian owned mills operating in Vancouver, Abbotsford, and Vancouver Island. And you know, these, the Punjabi sawmill worker community really should be recognized for the significant contributions that they have made to forestry in BC, in, in California. Um, you know, sometimes they may be somewhat unsung heroes, but there's, there's been absolute uh, tremendous contribution by South Asian peoples to, to these industries. In terms of dark times in, in South Asian history and Canadian history, um, on August 10th, 1907, the Asiatic Exclusion League was formed in BC with the goal of preventing immigration of peoples of Chinese, Japanese, and Indian origin into Canada. Um, Vancouver's then MP, Robert George McPherson, warned of an invasion of Asiatics who were swarming our country every month. Labor organizations were concerned that migrant workers were driving down wages for white workers, while others felt the new immigrants were simply incapable of assimilation into the broader community. Their slogan was, in fact, White Canada Forever. So these were very dark times. And uh, you know, with the lens of what we're seeing today, 
you know, th these are stories that are not, not told and unheard of. And I think it's really important that we bring them to light uh, because they have had impact and they, they are examples of systemic racism uh, within our community in Canada that uh, is not to be uh, denied. Um, in terms of an American context, in 1907, Bellingham Sikhs were beaten and chased out of the city. Um, on September 4th, 1907, about 500 white men in Bellingham, Washington, organized and rallied to drive Punjabi Sikh workers out of the lumber industry and the city itself. The angry mob moved through the town and pulled the Sikh men out of their beds, indiscriminately beat them, threw stones at them, and pocketed their valuables. In dire fear for their lives, many of the Indian men hid in boxcars or ditches, while most were chased out of the city amidst the cries of, do not come back. So this is, you know, a really important uh, time that, uh, again, you know, should be brought to light. I know that Sikh Lens has produced an incredible documentary about this topic. Uh, that's where I learned about this topic uh, the first time I watched this uh, last year. And it, it touched me uh, quite deeply. Um, and I knew that it had to be a part of this book um, because I know that, you know, those, those men had left from BC to go to Bellingham, you know, in search of jobs there, in the mills there, you know, and were forced back. There's not a lot known about, uh, you know, those men or those families or, or families that may be descendants of, of those men. Um, it's something that um, I just had a conversation with um, you know, uh, somebody who's a historian in, um, in the Bellingham area, and he was wondering if I had any connections, and I don't, but, you know, it just, it is something that has really um, touched my heart, like I said, and I want to learn more about, and um, I think it's something that should be uh, recognized. It is something that uh, the Bellingham community has actually uh, put up a wall, a commemorative wall to recognize uh, this injustice. So I do commend them for, for uh, making that, that happen. In 1907, racial terror also hit the streets of Vancouver, BC. So just a few days after the Bellingham riots, those incidences triggered a similar racially driven movement in Vancouver. On September 7th, 1907, the Asiatic Exclusion League of Vancouver smashed their way through Chinatown and Japantown in Vancouver's worst race riot on record. The enraged crowd stormed through Powell Street in Vancouver's Chinatown, destroying merchants' windows and damaging homes and assaulting Chinese people in the streets. The terrified merchants were able to tip off the Japanese um, merchants uh, so that they were actually prepared for this angry mob and they were prepared to fight back. You know, this overt racial discrimination was simply a sign of the times in the early 1900s. And the themes, these themes are interwoven throughout untold stories, and they are more relevant today than ever. You know, I really uh, was disturbed by some of these things that I had uncovered. I had never heard about them before, but I felt that they were really critical to include in terms of the timeline of historic events, because it helps us understand what the earliest settlers were experiencing. So, you know, seeing now with other marginalized people and other disenfranchised groups in our society coming to light, you know, we need to bring more of these types of, you know, incidences you know, to light in, in, uh, in modern history. Um, on a personal note, the Vancouver race riots, again, were never taught in schools. I had never heard about them before until uh, my process here. So the best way for us to uh, learn about the mistakes of our past and to not repeat them is to acknowledge them. On July 22, 1906, the Khalsa Dewan Society of Vancouver was formed and the foundation stone for the very first Sikh temple in North America was officially laid. Um, it's one of the oldest religious societies in Canada and KDS really played a pivotal role in the establishment of the new Sikh temples. And those temples became a forum for gathering, for welcoming new immigrants, for discussing uh, news of the day from back home. It became a place to mobilize 
and, and gather and uh, really become activists for fighting for South Asian causes. So the, the Guadalajaras were very instrumental, you know, along with being a place to practice faith. Um, they were instrumental in so many, so many ways. Um, Sikh temples were built in the Victoria, Abbotsford, and Fraser Mill communities. And to celebrate key events, the entire Sikh sun, Sangit would move, the congregation would move from Godwara to Godwara. So it wasn't like they practiced their faith in their community. They really, truly were uh, one community and, uh, you know, not separated by regions. Um, so it was really a way for them to connect and, uh, and to support each other uh, in those early days. In 1908, the BC government passed a discriminatory law preventing South Asian men from voting because eligibility for federal elections originated from provincial voting lists. They were also unable to vote in federal elections. So provincial disenfranchisement also denied South Asians access to things like political office, jury duty, and public service jobs. And this was very much intentional. Um, the government of Canada also introduced the continuous journey regulation, which prohibited the entry of any persons who did not travel by continuous passage from their country of origin or citizenship. So what this regulation did was it effectively halted South Asian immigration um, after 1908, as no shipping company provided a direct sailing from India to Canada, given its distance. So this amendment to the immigration gave the government sweeping powers to exclude people explicitly based on their race or ethnicity. In fact, it truly was a policy of exclusion. If you have not heard about the continuous journey regulation, I do urge you to learn about it. Um, you know, the federal government also imposed hefty head tax fines for people of South Asian descent. Now, these rules are very different for people coming from immigrant, sorry, these rules are very different for people coming from European countries where Canada was at the time openly accepting a number of migrants uh, from these uh, European countries. So um, this certainly was a time of disenfranchisement for the South Asian people. And now looking at the slide, it's, it's really important to note how South Asians were portrayed in the local press at the time. Um, these are cartoonish images. Mainstream media reported the influx of migrants from India as an invasion. These were the words used by mainstream press. Um, this is well documented in history and it's something that it was important to me to cover in the book because it really showed the slant of people's perspective of the times. Historical records of media reports also report, um, you know, South Asians as a quote unquote burden to the city and they were proclaimed to be destructive to the British way of life in the province. You know, very, very sad times that uh, that's the type of language that was being used. And articles would urge action to restrict Indian immigration with news articles that read, get rid of Hindus at any cost. Now, Sikhs were often mistakenly referred to um, as Hindus. Um, but it's just, you know, the, the language of, um, of invasion, um, you know, hordes of, you know, South Asians arriving, you know, this is the type of language that we're dealing with and um, really, really critical to the narrative that we understand um, that this is what, you know, the South Asian community was faced with. So, so you know, what, upon arrival, the first settlers did feel a lot of pressure, the men felt a lot of pressure to conform to Canadian culture for greater acceptance. And as part of their Sikh religion, the men, you know, uh, migrating from India wore turbans and kept beards, which were distinctive characteristics of their Sikh faith. Um, and what would happen is, you know, many of the men were facing racial discrimination. They were being assaulted. They were being barred from entering public facilities. And so, you know, they were finding that they felt that they had to conform to Canadian culture by removing their turbans 
and you know, cutting their hair and their beards just to fit in. Um, you know, very, very sad because these were very strong symbols of their devout Sikh faith. Um, so it's sad that they would have to do so to be accepted by society. Um, my profile on Bachchan Singh Deol, um, there you have him, you know, in the top right hand corner there and circled, you know, once he, you know, end up, you know, having uh, a haircut. He learned very quickly that life would be easier for him if he, you know, shaved his beard and cut his hair and, you know, co complete assimilation was his only choice for acceptance and potentially for better paying jobs. So, you know, Bachchan Singh finally made the very difficult to decision to do so. And he, he even had trouble finding a barber um, who would serve him and who would serve him and his other Punjabi, um, you know, countrymen to, you know, even help them, you know, with this, with this, with, you know, cutting of their, their hair. So sadly at that time, only Chinese barbers would cut the hair of South Asian men who were just trying to do their best to conform to society. So Bachchan Singh actually went on to become very active in the Godwar community and he served his community from 1957 to 1959. And in a sad turn of events, um, Bachchan Singh faced discrimination again by new immigrants in the South Asian community this time who looked at him as uh, because he actually had a haircut. Uh, they felt that he wasn't as devout a Sikh as they were because they had maintained, you know, turbans and beers. And of course, they had come much later than Bachchan Singh, who had arrived in the early 1930s. So, you know, he retired from, from service to the Guadalajara. I think it's an important story because it um, just shows you, you know, all different levels of, of um, you know, injustice that, that took place. Um, you know, so it's something that we should, you know, again, be, be aware of. Uh, just an interesting note in terms of uh, the Punjabi Sikh men, many men at the time did drop their surnames and went with the, with the name Singh, or they used their ancestral village name as their surname. So for Bachchan Singh, many knew him as Bachchan, uh, Bachchan Singh Gurm, with Gurm being his village. So, and then the variations in spelling of their surnames was often just a result of how the passport officer documented them. So you're going to see all different variations of spellings of the name Dosanj, Dosanj, uh, Johal, Joel. Uh, really, they all come from the same place in the same village in Punjab, but it, uh, it really was the whim of the passport officer and those names stuck and those families retained uh, those spellings. And the same would be said about Core. Uh, you'll see many different variations of the spelling Core, but really it is of the same, which is a middle name for of uh, Punjabi Sikh women. Um, in 1911, the census listed that there were only 2,342 South Asians in BC, and of that, only three were women. And there's very little known or documented about those very first women who migrated during this period. So the lack of women or wives being allowed to enter the country really prohibited the growth of South Asian families in Canada, and it was intentional intentional, unfortunately. So Dr. Sundar Singh and a small group of, uh, of, of delegates went to Ottawa in November 1912 to petition for immigration rights, particularly for the rights of South Asian women and family reunification. So he had traveled with three other activists, Raja Singh, the Secretary of the United India League, Professor Teja Singh, the Cambridge and Harvard-educated lawyer, and Reverend Hall, who is a missionary and prominent figure of the Hindu Friends Society in Victoria. So, urging the government for more fair and equal treatment of South Asian people, Dr. Sundar Singh implored that not even dogs are treated like we are. He stated that South Asians were law-abiding citizens who had contributed much to the development of the West while still accepting the roughest possible work known to man. It's a really important time and uh, I hope you get a chance to read the book to learn more about Sundar Singh and, and uh, you know, his advocacy for, uh, for pi the pioneer course. When we talk about the South Asian immigrants coming here, 
this is my experience as well. Mostly I've seen the, the stories of the women get subdued or it, get, it gets overshadowed by the men who immigrated here. Um, what was like, how did you bring out their stories or? You know, the stories are predominantly male centric uh, because it was the South Asian men who were the first to arrive and, uh, you know, who were the only ones to arrive in the beginning. So, you know, there's a lot more documented about them. And even speaking to the families, you know, I had to, because this was so important to me, to ensure that we, you know, shine the light on the Pioneer Corps as well, I would make sure that I asked the story, you know, sorry, ask the question, where was BBG at this time? You know, what was her role? And sometimes they didn't know. But I would ask again and again, and you know, somehow incredible nuggets would come out. An example is, uh, well, you know, BBG didn't didn't come to Canada. You know, she didn't really have much contribution. Well, what was she doing? Well, she was back home, so she was looking after the kids. I think she was also looking after you know, you know, grand grandfather's uh, parents until you know their aging days, and you know, she held down you know, the household uh, in Punjab uh, with very little or, or no credit for uh, what she had contributed. And, and in fact, she was never able to rejoin her, her family and her children were able to migrate. So many times, the, you know, the migrant the, would become sort of a hero, uh, you know, because he was now in Canada. But the women that were there that had made all these sacrifices and were left behind, um, and experienced a lot of hardship themselves where, you know, were often didn't have the same status uh, in, in their country. So it, it's an interesting anecdote. And, you know, I really wanted to understand the, the journey of the Pioneer Corps. Um, so in 1919, the Canadian government uh, finally loosened some immigration bans and started to allow the South Asian women and first daughters to arrive in Canada. So prior to that, there were some um, South Asian women who had migrated, very few and far between, but um, that is when they were officially welcomed. And you know, their first experiences in Canada were very difficult. They were told to leave behind um, you know, their customary Punjabi clothing, their you know, beautiful silk, silk saris and tapatas and uh, you know, hand-sewn clothing, and they were told to leave them behind. And if in fact they did bring them, um, they were told very quickly that they would have to burn them and never to wear them. Otherwise they would not be accepted into Canadian society. So I've heard countless stories of um, you know, Pioneer Corps who had to burn um, you know, their, their beautiful clothing in the fireplace. Uh, because it was, you know, they just were not to be wearing them and they were taken to stores to, to go purchase dresses that they had never worn, that were not comfortable to them and, you know, they would find ways to adapt by, you know, wearing leggings so that they wouldn't have to show bare legs, um, you know, and try to adapt to a dress code that, you know, met the, you know, their, their Sikh faith. So they would still maintain their, their head covers um, along with their dresses and, you know, opted for longer dresses um, to, you know, keep their humility and, uh, you know, would often hand sew their own, own dresses with whatever materials that they could find. If it meant they would save the potato sacks or the rice sacks, they would do that um, to save money. But I think it's a really important part because they were somewhat their journey was somewhat silent. They, they'd never learned to speak English. They didn't have jobs outside of the home in those early days. They were, uh, you know, homemakers and very much life in Canada would resemble village life in India. And, uh, you know, the men were the, were the workers and the breadwinners um, and, and the women just had to, had to adapt. And they really focused their life around the Godwara community and, and service and giving back. So, um, you know, when you read untold stories uh, on through every page, I've, I've really tried my best to highlight the untold stories of these women, uh, these incredible women who um, really are uh, the heart of, of, of the story in many cases. 
1943, South Asians rallied for citizens' rights in Canada. Uh, in 1943, the Khalsa Dewan Society reignited a vigorous fair play campaign for South Asians' voting rights in the province. The society stepped up out of uh, stepped up their efforts and canvassed labor and business organizations to support their bid for equitable treatment. And labor organizations took part because they valued the Sikh workers and they wanted to keep them. So you know they really partnered with um, these activists. So organizations like the IWA, which is the International Woodworkers of America, joined forces in a plea to extend the franchise to South Asians. Um, the delegation uh, went to Victoria and made a very impressive presentation to the committee on behalf of all of the South Asian settlers. The brief, pre prevented, sorry, the brief presented by the group stated, under the stress of war and under the military laws of Canada, our young men are now going into military service and they wear the badge of Canada on their shoulder like Canadians of any other racial origin. Thus, we are in the position of not only being willing to work and fight for Canada and to die for Canada, but of being considered good, not good enough to vote for Canada. So really powerful, powerful statements that, uh, you know, just give me goosebumps and thinking about, you know, the, the rights of, of, of these peoples and the fact that, you know, they were able to own mills, they were able to employ people, but they were not able to vote uh, in the province. They were not able to vote in the country. They could give their lives and die for this country, but they could not have a say or become a citizen of this country. Um, something really important that, you know, we're only looking as far back as 19, 43, when this was a cause still to be fought for. And can you draw a parallel between the South Asian history in Canada regarding the same thing that you talked about, that they are they're willing to lay down the life for the country, but still they're not getting back or they're not getting the basic things. And can we include the Black Lives Matter that's going on currently? Same, they have their culture, they're ready to do everything for their country, they're ready to lay down their lives for their country, but all they're asking for is a basic respect or equality. Yeah. Can you draw absolutely. A parallel there? Yeah, I absolutely see a lot of parallels to you know what is going on with the Black Lives Matter movement right now. That you know, black people are simply asking for the very basic fundamental thing that that they matter, you know that they they are they count that they're equal citizens they're not asking for much more and uh you know i really you know have got having gone through this process and having sort of the revolution that's happening around black lives matter come to light after the book was released i, I just saw so many parallels that really touched me deeply because you know it was really the, the basic fundamental rights that they're looking for um, and that, you know, the people of, of Black, you know, origin are also looking for. So, you know, absolutely. And, you know, I think, you know, in modern times, yes, there's, there's still challenges with immigration. Yes, there's, we're not in, in any, in a perfect world by any stretch of imagination. We have made tremendous progress uh, for South Asians in Canada. Absolutely. We have people that have risen to the ranks of leadership that are now, you know, you know, making decisions, you know, about the fundamental direction of our country. And, you know, the, the Canadian Minister of National Defense, uh, Harjit Singh Sajjan, is a, is a devout Sikh, and he is the first to have held that, that high-ranking position. So, you know, we are, we are seeing changes, but we have a long way to go on so many fronts, and, and particularly in Canada, in terms of, you know, Indigenous rights and the rights of Indigenous people. So I try to, through this process, educate myself, not just on the South Asian experience, but the Black Lives experience, the, the Indigenous experience, and you know, the other um, you know, Asian experience and, as well, and you know, what that has been like, and what living in a post-COVID world has been like, and some of the, the sentiments that 
people of Chinese descent or Japanese descent or Korean descent are currently facing. Um, you know, these are, these are really important issues and, um, you know, now is the time for us to be having this type of a dialogue and educating ourselves uh, and really speaking out for injustices that we see in our own community, using our voice, using our own platforms, whether that's our social media channels or other ways to bring light to um, the causes of marginalized peoples. And how would you, like what, sh what shall the younger generation specifically, like you have two sons, uh, yeah. pretty young, I think. Yes. The children who are growing up during this age, the things that they are, they are seeing, like through the book, through this particular project, what would you like them to capture so they don't do the same mistakes 10 years down the line? five years down the line. Absolutely. I think it comes with being informed, being educated, um, being able to watch media with a bit of a critical eye, you know, being um, asking questions about information that's given to you, asking questions about information that is not given to you. So they are in the school system now and they're, uh, you know, I have a son who's in university and I have one who will be entering grade 11. And I think it's really important for them to question all the answers and to use their voice as a platform. So if they see something, whether it's on social media, call it out if it doesn't sit right with you, with your own moral compass. And to, um, to learn about you know, the history of the past so that we don't repeat those mistakes again in the future. Um, we all have a responsibility to do that. And I think that um, this process has really shaped the lens in which I view the world. It has shaped the lens in which I serve as a mother. Um, it has shaped the lens in which I serve uh, my community. So in 1945, BC Sikhs had formed a very critical alliance with the Stockton, California Sikhs. So a delegation of prominent BC South Asians, including Arjun Singh Randhawa, Mahinder Singh Deedal, Naginder Singh Gill, and Deedar Singh visited the Sikh community in Stockton, California. So this is our BC California connection here. As officers of the Kalsadawan Society, uh, the men joined an international uh, leader from India and the sister of the India's then uh, pro-independence activist, uh, Nehru, on March 13, 1945 in California. And what they did was share learnings and they shared sort of commonalities that they were facing in BC and California and some of the sort of discriminatory actions that they were faced by their, their own governments. And they talked about how to overcome racial barriers for the migrant community uh, in both Canada and the US. So they shared a lot of, of great information and it was um, a really pivotal time just prior to India's independence. Um, so, you know, there's a lot documented about um, this collaboration. So again, I urge you to learn a little bit more about this strong connection between BC and California Sikhs. Okay, so 1947 was an epic year. So thanks to the steadfast efforts of many, South Asians were finally granted the right to vote and to become Canadian citizens. This was a monumental step forward. Uh, and it really in changing the restrictive immigration laws. And it marked the end of a 40 year struggle for South Asian civil rights in Canada. So pictured there is Mohinder Singh Bido. He made history by becoming the very first South Asian to cast a vote in Canada in 1947. So his family story is uh, featured um, in the book. I had a chance to interview his daughter um, about Mohinder Singh's journey and actually Mahinder Singh's father and uh, mother's journey as well, who were you know, the first settlers within that family. This is a family that is now six generations strong in Canada. And uh, you know, it's, it's an incredible story of, of activism and service. And uh, Bansi Pajali, who is Mahinder Singh's daughter, uh, continues on the legacy of service to the community in, in uh, Victoria, BC. Great story. So in 1958, Canada finally opened its doors to South Asian extended families. Um, the Canadian government allowed South Asian Canadians to sponsor 
a wide range of relatives, including mothers and fathers over the age of 65. So they weren't just only allowed to come here to fill laborers' jobs, they were allowing families to come and families to um, you know, reunite in Canada. By 1962, the government removed almost all racial and national restrictions from its Immigration Act. At this time, the Canadian government adopted open immigration rules, ending the quota by country system. South Asians uh, between the years of 1962 to 71, the migration increased exponentially and would continue to rise over the years. So with these changes, the second and third wave of Indian immigrants were able to take advantage of family sponsorships for joining relatives who were already well established in Canada. So 1959 was when you know my father was able to arrive based on um, Baba G. Gyan Singh's sponsorship. So we're just one example of that. You know, had that not changed, you know, I wouldn't be here telling you this story. Um, you know, I wouldn't be born here on Canadian soil. And the same for my my siblings and you know and, and my cousins. So you know, it was really an important time in Canadian history for, for many, many South Asians. So by lifting the immigration restrictions, South Asian extended families were finally able to flourish in Canadian society. Today, there are over 500,000 Sikhs in Canada, which represents 1.4% of the Canadian population. In 2017, April became officially named Sikh Heritage Month in the province of British Columbia, and Canada became the first country in the world to adopt former legislation to recognize April as Sikh Heritage Month. So it's a point of great pride for, for all of us. And um, our book was intended to launch in April 2020, right in the middle of Sikh Heritage Month. And of course, COVID had other plans for us. So um, you know what? We hope in 2021, we're able to do some more exciting events around this book and this content you know, while engaging the public. And Kiran, uh, like you said, the Sikh Heritage Month, does that has to do something with the, like the cover photograph of it? Like I was seeing when I was looking at the book, there are 100 other photographs, but why particularly this photograph for the cover? Is there any cover story that we have? Yes, absolutely. So this cover story really spoke to me. And uh, the moment I saw it, I knew that it was going to be the cover of the book. And the reason why is it's not often that you see at a mill site, you know, a father, um, you know, with his daughter, um, other children, uh, elders, you see, you know, a man from, you know, a Caucasian man, and, you know, all mixed in. So it's a very multi-generational uh, image. And uh, that little girl in, the, in the, the, the picture really spoke to me. I knew that uh, she was, you know, with us and I, I wanted to meet her and I wanted to, you know, talk to her about her recollections growing up as a child in the Mitchell Island community. So really this, this picture provides a view of South Asian pioneer life across generations and cultures. And it focuses on the Lori Singh, who is the father, who is with his daughter, Cecil Kaur Singhira, who was age two at the time, an unknown boy and other sawmill workers on Mitchell Island in 1936. The Lori Singh immigrated to Canada in 1907 and his daughter was born to his wife Nahal Kaur in 1934. So once the bustling sawmill community Mitchell Island really formed a vital link between Vancouver and Richmond and was home to some of the early settlers in BC. Um, so on the right, you see Cecil Corbain's there uh, today when I was able to present her with a copy of Untold Stories and she was simply overjoyed. And it was just wonderful to hear her perspective of, you know, of her mom's journey, of the journey of her siblings and, and of her, 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 her father. So in terms of South Asian life, um, Cecil Cor openly says that the South Asian community, it's grown so much and over the years, it's, she's just happy to see that. But she says that it's interesting is sometimes you hear comments that if you're a Canadian born, you may not necessarily be aware of the many long-standing traditions. And she wanted people to know that that could be farthest from the truth. 
you know, because she looks Canadian, she sounds Canadian, having been born here, that, you know, she was very, very connected to the pioneer legacy, the pioneer community, and to her Indian roots and her heritage. And, uh, you know, she, she thinks that sometimes that uh, is, a, is a marker that uh, I guess long timers, old timers in the community get by their, by, you know, immigrants that may have followed them. So, you know, again, it just speaks back to, uh, you know, per different perceptions. Um, you know, these are folks that had broken down a lot of barriers so that, uh, you know, others could come. And I think it's really important that their perspectives be valued. Um, so she does, uh, in her quote, she, that's there, she really speaks about how the pioneer children really did their very best to honor both their Indian and their Canadian heritage as, as the best as they could, the best of both worlds. So mm -hmm. her, her story is really wonderful um, one to read. And do you have any story about the photographer? Um, and I believe he's a Chinese gentleman, Yu Shou Chao, who captured yeah. photographs. Any stories that you have on him? Absolutely. So Yu Shou Chao was quite a prolific uh, photographer who ran his studio from 1906 to 1949. Now, he was really the only photographer at the time who would photograph um, other um, immigrant, sorry, he was really the only photographer at the time who would capture images of other marginalized people. So Japanese immigrants, Chinese immigrants, South Asian immigrants, the black community. He's got an incredible record of, uh, of imagery from those early, early days. And, you know, often dressed in their finest of attire, uh, families would come in so that they could capture their Canadian experience and send their pictures back to, um, to families back home. And just to think that they would visit numerous photographers who would turn them away who refused to take their photographs is, is very sad. So, you know, his photos really captured, you know, these, these early settlers kind of straddling both worlds. Um, and I think Mr. Chow was probably unaware of what he was chronicling, the rare images that he was chronicling. And uh, he captured, you know, South Asian activists, war veterans, scholars, um, you know, and, and people that were were likely looked down upon simply because of their race. Um, we have captured one of the largest collections of Yu Cho Chao originals that came directly from pioneer families. They dusted off their photo albums and would share these images with me. And I would know right away that it was a Yu Cho Chao original based on, you know, backdrops in the studio, certain camera angles or certain furniture that was, um, was in the photo, I was able to clearly identify that these were Yu Cho Chows. And every time one would come to light, it was, it was like finding a rare and precious stamp. Um, so I'm so excited about uh, this section of the book. Um, we know that Yu Cho Chow, uh, once his sons had um, retired from the business, they did not keep any of the negatives. They had burned all of the negatives. And so really these original artifacts are sitting in the homes of the pioneer elders in many cases wouldn't even know that they're sitting on this precious gem so it was really uh something exciting to to find those those pieces of history again and any other photographers or any other uh street photos that you remember or any stories behind that that you want to discuss which captured that that diversity and the vibrancy in vancouver Yes, absolutely. There was another photographer. His name was Fonsi Police, who uh, repositioned his business uh, because of uh, the World Wars and because of the Great Depression, because the you know studio time was expensive, getting film was expensive. So he found a new way of doing business, much like people are doing right now in a post-COVID world. So during World War One and the Great Depression, many photographers closed down their studios unless people could find professional photography sessions. So Fonsi police would, you know, park himself in a sort of, you know, desirable spot in Vancouver around the 700 block of Granville Street, and he would snap shots, uh, action shots of pastor, passers-by, sometimes taking up to 5,000 snaps a day. Fonsi's photos became known 
as the spot for Vancouverites to see and be seen while they're dressed to the nines. So he happened to capture, you know, a vibrant, you know, and diverse and multicultural scene in Vancouver and many, many South Asians um, who would get dressed to the nines and go have their photo taken so they could send it back to their family. The prices of the pictures were three pictures for 15, 50 cents in the 1940s. And uh, many would purchase these copies and Fonsi would pass on a ticket and they would go back and, you know, get their, uh, get their uh, originals. So in Fonsi's 40 plus years of operation, he took millions of candid photos and much like Yu Jo Chow, he burned all of his negatives. So again, these, these treasure troves are sitting in family homes and there's one of my own father-in-law in, you know, with the, so the page boy hat there. Uh, that was taken in the streets of New West on Columbia Street that he says, you know, I don't know what, what uh, you know, sparked me to buy the picture. It was $5. It was really expensive, but I got it. And now, you know, we've got this iconic image of, of our dad walking the streets of New West as a young, as a very young man. And there's many families that have that same experience. So we've got an incredible collection, again, one of the largest collection of South Asians as photographed by Fonsi police in, uh, in the book. So, you know, this was really a point of pride for me to, you know, personally collect these, these images because I knew right away when I looked, them, looked at them from the camera angle and how he had shot his subjects to be sort of larger than life, that it was a photo taken by, by famous Fonsi. I'm sure to be very thankful to Fonsi and Yosha Chow for capturing all these photographs. If they haven't captured it, this book wouldn't have been there and many families wouldn't even know, okay, how their, the children won't know how their parents look like when they first came in there or the families or, or the, the photographs captured that moment in the past or in the history that wouldn't have been difficult to get it in front of the audience at large now. Absolutely. So Karen, uh, you have two kids. How do they feel to have a published author at home now? <laughs> you know, I I think they're really, really proud, and they have actually shared that with me. I think they wondered all that time, you know, I think they saw, you know, how, how much work, you know, I was putting into this book night and day. It was, it was some nights when, you know, I wasn't sleeping and I would wake up with some new revelation or discovery that I would share with them. And then sometimes it was quite emotional, and I think that uh, they watched me, you know, go through that process and really toil. And at the end, to have this book come to fruition, you know, I, my younger son looked at me and said, Mom, you did it. You did it. I'm really proud of you. Uh -huh. And my older son said, you know, Mom, you, um, you know, you set your mind to this and uh, you, you made it happen, you know. And so they very much are, are proud of, of what I do and the contributions that I'm making. And they really hope that as they get older, and they read the book. They're going to know that there's a lot of life lessons built into this book that are lessons uh, and morals for them that I too hope to leave behind. They're the morals that mattered to me mm -hmm. when I was you know, hearing about the South Asian families. And one of the biggest ones was they didn't just come here to be successful for themselves, right? They helped other people's kids be successful too. They also made sure other family members and friends had a hand up and rose with them. So, you know, I think that's something we've lost a part of that in society. I think people are, you know, much, much more inwardly focused. They're much, much more competitive. People don't just do things out of the goodness of their heart for somebody else without an expectation of return. So we've lost some of that. I really hope that that's a value that comes back. And uh, it is certainly has been something that's really close to my heart you know my children have been privileged to you know go to great schools and you know to have a lot of opportunities that um some kids don't have just based on the, the postal code so you know i've made it my mission um to you know give my time to those postal codes and to you know quote unquote inner city schools where they may not have the same level of support or resources or even guidance at home. Um, you know, we've all heard about the, the issue with youth gangs in our community and it's a, it's a negative story and a negative narrative that is played over and over. 
it is something that, you know, we want to replace those narratives with positive ones and give, you know, our kids new heroes to, to look to and new role, role models to look to. And why not, you know, go as far back as the very first, you know, who cleared the path for, for all of us to rise. And I feel very personally connected to this story, now obviously, in so many ways, based on the experiences of my ancestors, the ones that I was born into and the family that I'm married into, I feel very close to that. So, you know, it's something that I'm hoping that, um, you know, my sons, uh, you know, really, really take to heart. The universe is certainly smiling on you, Karen. And had this COVID thing or pandemic haven't happened, you had already planned like for the Sikh Heritage Month for a, like a um, release of the book, a small family gathering, get together, but the global pandemic affected that. What other things that the global pandemic brought down upon while you were working on it, during the publishing, or just in general, because it wasn't expected at all. Right in the middle of the production of this book, we were suddenly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic in March of 2020. So, you know, the event that we had in terms of the launch event, we, we had uh, postponed and canceled knowing that um, this just wasn't a time to gather our elders together and that, um, you know, we really needed to, you know, look out for the health and well-being of our families and our community. And our collective focus really shifted to, um, to ourselves. So, you know, I think when I was writing this book, I never imagined that we would be in a situation that was similar to our pioneers. Here we were. Um, we know that our, our settlers had, had survived unfathomable challenges like, you know, pandemics like the Black Plague, the Spanish flu, you know, illnesses like tuberculosis. Those, those are all documented through these stories. They had also endured economic hardships like the Great Depression and uncertainty such as travel restrictions related to, uh, you know, two world wars. So they were experiencing all of these things. I didn't think that we would feel, you know, we would be experiencing these things today. You know, the, you know, the early settlers were worried about things like basic human concerns, like access to uh, food and shelter and health care. They're worried about financial stability, uh, finding jobs, and looking past disc this discrimination of the times. We started to see those parallels all of a sudden come to life as we were worried about the same things. And I, I could not help but you know, reflect on you know, some of the stories that I had heard of the elders. And Cecil Corbain's actually put it very well. She said, you know, I grew up in the, in, you know, you know, in the depression era uh, where grocery and, and items were, you know, hard to come by. So we would go to the grocery store and we always, you know, would order just what we needed. We never ever took more than we needed. And that really resonated with me knowing that when we were starting to see really poor human behavior of, um, you know, hoarding supplies and, you know, things being not available, basic supplies not being available on shelf that, you know, back in you know, the 1930s, somehow our pioneer elders and settlers knew better um, and that they knew to share uh, what they had and, um, you know, look out for each other, and look out for not just their own families, but, you know, other families in their community. So it was um, a lot of parallels that I saw so I think more than ever, you know, in this modern age that we're in, there's so much to be learned by paying close attention to the, these lessons, these poignant lessons of our past. You know, sadly, we, you know, we've lost a lot of our elder community through this global pandemic. Their voices are being silenced. So I think it's put even into more perspective for me, the fact that we need to value elders in our society we need to cherish their journeys. We need to listen to them and we need to value their experiences. Um, so, you know, these are all things that have really risen to the surface during this COVID world that we live in. Um, and I think that, um, you know, preserving their oral histories, you know, I started all that work prior to uh, COVID and, uh, you know, it was a very 
rewarding experience, you know, like I said, to go visit the elders who, in many cases, when I presented them with a book, I was the first point of contact uh, for them outside of their family, you know? And of course, I left the book at the doorstep. I took six feet back and, you know, they were just overjoyed um, to, to see me again. And, uh, but this time I came with a project that, that, that I had promised them. So, you know, very, very, um, it was, has been a very uh, meaningful time and uh, uh, you have learned a lot. Any closing remarks, any suggestions or any advice for the younger generation coming up, Karen? So in closing, on behalf of Suki Pengelia and the Arch Media Group and our designer and our artist, I just wanted to thank Vicky Singh and Ajwasi um, Sharma of Seek Lens. I wanted to thank Mindy Hutchinson. I want to thank yourself um, and the entire team at Chapman University for, you know, just inviting me to speak to you so candidly today. I hope everybody on, on the, uh, the lesson here, the virtual lesson is finding it informative and uh, it's, it has really has been a personal journey as an author and editor. And reach out to me personally at my email if you have any questions and do visit ajlegacy.com if you wanna learn more about the project. So I just wanted to leave you know, all of the students on this call with uh, one last thought that I think is quite powerful uh, from the late novelist Michael Crichton who is reported to have said that if you don't know history and you don't know anything, you are a leaf that doesn't even know that it's part of a tree. History teaches us that we are a small part of something that is much, much bigger than ourselves. It is humbling. History humbles you. Um, history teaches you. History can disturb you, but history can also clarify the world for you. So not only will you learn about the leaves, but you'll learn about the twigs, the branches, the trunks, and the entire roots of life. Thank you everybody for, for your time today. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much for your time. And everyone, this is our one of the first virtual lectures. We'll have more soon to support Ash Media and Karen. All the links will be given below to buy the books. There will be direct link provided right below in the description. Uh, help support Karen, Ash Media, so these stories can be told again and again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much.